Welcome, welcome, welcome to a gathering to celebrate a relationship that we have with our Lord and Savior. A relationship that we know is based on scriptural foundations that we have been exposed to for years and years and don't want to give up on it. Let us take a moment to open in prayer, if you will. Our Heavenly Father, as we gather today, we ask that your Spirit be poured upon us. Be poured upon us to where we are overflowing with the love and understanding of who you are and what you are in our lives. Lord, have mercy on us, for we are all sinners and find ourselves often to come short of what you want us to be. Years ago, Daniel composed a prayer that he offered as he found himself in a position where his 70 years in captivity by the Babylonians was coming to an end. He was under oppression of misguided leaders in those lands. The prayer as it would be written today says, we understand from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to us, that the desolation of the Moravian Church, North America, may be of a consequence of recent synods. So many concerned Moravians have turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and, position, and petition, spending much time to answering a call to divine guidance. We prayed to the Lord and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong. We've been wicked and have rebelled. We've turned away from your commands and laws, and we have not paid attention to the scriptural words like those of the prophets who spoke in your name to kings and princes and all the people of their land. We have determined that your warnings of yesteryear aren't applicable to today. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of leadership and laypersons of several of your modern day churches and denominations seem to have become unfaithful to you. We are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him, we have not obeyed the Lord our God, or kept the spirit of guidance as given through the scriptures. Many have transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the, course, the curses and sworn judgments found in the scriptures will be poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You fulfill the words spoken against them and against their rulers by bringing on great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what was done to Jerusalem. Just as written in the law of Moses, all this disaster came on them. Even we often have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster on them, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. 
Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of Israel with a mighty hand and who made yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned and we have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from us. Our sinfulness and deviation from guidance of our ancestors have made us as North American Moravians an object of scorn to more than 90% of the God-fearing Moravians in the worldwide church. Now, O oh God, hear our prayers and petitions of your servants. For, you, for your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O oh God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the church that bears your name. We do not make request of you because you're righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, O oh God, do not delay, because your church and your people should bear your name. Our Heavenly Father, as we continue with this meeting, be with us. Give us guidance and understanding as to what the next step should be as we work to truly save the Moravian Church and be the true light, the true salt that needs to be found in a world that is hurting. For it is in your name and your name alone that we're here. Amen. Just a few quick announcements uh, as, as we get started here. First of all, uh, we'd like to thank Mike Lambeth for providing uh, the music for us today. And it's, um, uh, it, it helps create the kind of ambience that confirms to us that God is here. We'd also like to thank Friedberg for making this facility available to us and to once again to to Mike and and um, uh, Regina for helping to set up uh, the fellowship hall for a gathering after the event after the this uh, and uh, which puts me in, uh, on the next note that after the service there will be desserts and beverage in the uh, fellowship hall and and time for, for fellowship and, and um, uh, response to, to what um, uh, you, you've uh, witnessed today. <clears throat> Should you have a donation that you would like to make to um, Concerned Moravians, and we are not asking for it, but if, if you feel so led, um, because we aren't set up as a 501c3 organization yet, uh, cash is the only thing that we can take. We don't have a, a way to turn a check into, into um, a good donation. So uh, if you feel so led, and only if you feel so led, there will be an offering plate in the back. Today also we have prepared a questionnaire to get a response for, from concerned Moravians as to where you think we should go next and, and to get an understanding of, of how, possibly even how comfortable you are within uh, the congregation, respective congregations that you're in. So um, that uh, questionnaire will be available after the meeting and um, th there'll be um, someone stationed at, at the doors to pass that out. You can either mail it back to us or send it back through uh, email. So um, be sure and watch for that. As we continue the service, uh, let's open our hymn books to um, uh, hymn 680 and sing, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.
As a speaker this, uh, for this event, I had the privilege of approaching a good friend of mine, and I call him a good friend because we're actually brothers. We're, we're brothers in Christ, and I, I mean that sincerely. He, uh, he has touched my life in so many, so many ways. <clears throat> Kevin is a former Moravian minister and accepted a call to a community church in Davie County about 10 years ago. He is a true man of God and listens and watches and is intent on doing just what God has called him to do. So if you will, accept Brother Kevin Frack to the front. I hope you can say as kindly about me after I'm finished as when we start, and I hope you feel as openly disposed to, to hearing from the Lord. I look out, I recognize a lot of your faces. Mine may not look as familiar as it used to because I'm older. Um, if I share anything today, and I'm not sure yet what to share, because I really am convicted and convinced that God has a lot more to say to us than we want to hear. Is that possible? And in fact, if we heard the full measure of what God really wants to share with us, we would run. Because his will is overwhelming, and therefore my reason for being here in front of you is not to tell you answers of what to do, but rather to share the testimony perhaps of my own failure and the pain of having been where you are many, many decades. And <clears throat> so my first question this morning or this afternoon, since it's not morning anymore, what are you concerned about? Do you know? The future of the Moravian Church and part of the question behind that, in all kindness, having grown up in the Moravian Church, having loved the Moravian Church, having been trained to serve in and through the Moravian Church, having felt called to step away from the Moravian Church, not in condemnation, I, I want to be public about that, but really in exploration of life beyond the Moravian Church, <clears throat> which, by the way, there's a whole kingdom of God that I've discovered that is amazing. And uh, we have a lot to learn from what God's doing elsewhere in the kingdom. But I believe that if we're open to hearing from the Lord, we have a lot to learn within it as well. So you're concerned about the future of the Moravian church. What if God's not? I'm, I'm asking some open questions. Anything else you think I need to know before you hear something that I might be used to say? What are you concerned about? You came on a Sunday afternoon when you could be watching the Panthers play football. Or you could be watching Wake Forest play basketball. Or who knows what else we could have done this afternoon that we chose not to do because we came here. And I want to say up front, Thank you for praying. If I could say anything that you need to do like you've never done before, pray. It's the one thing that God gives us as a gift in spiritual warfare that we can be proactive about. And I believe it's not that prayer works miracles, but God can work miracles through his people who are broken with him in prayer. And what prayer becomes is our exercise of faith that 
avails ourselves just as we are before a holy God in the face of things that are so far over our heads to manage or to, to respond to, we know we can't save the world. I would like to say, I know I can't save the Moravian church. I didn't always know that. In fact, when my wife and I <clears throat> talk about our service in the Moravian church, 20-some years ago in 1995, we were happily ensconced in a new church plant in Columbus, Ohio. And God had the sense of humor to ruin our life by calling us to serve a church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Let me back up 20 years earlier. When I met my wife from Kernersville, I took a vow before God and her that I would never serve a church in Winston-Salem. And do you know why? Because there were too many Moravians here and too many opinions of what that meant to be open to what God might mean to such a group called the Moravian Church. Now, God looked at that arrogant young man in love and he called me to the last place I wanted to be, I thought, to fix the church. Because for the 20-some years prior to that, in another province of the Moravian, in two other provinces of the Moravian church, I did everything in my power and everything in my ability to bring the church to reformation again. In fact, I can remember having drafted legislation for the northern province in the 1970s that laid on the table the conviction that because the Moravian church was no longer behaving according to its formative documents, that we need to confess before a holy God that we no longer were the church of our origin and repent before him as a public gathering of believers from all over the northern province and ask God in repentance to restore us again to himself. That was 40 years ago. I've been at this a long time. Because for whatever reason in God's mind and heart, he put me in a part of the church where people didn't know the gospel yet. And people's lives were upended by civil war in Central America and where the Holy Spirit had to move on people's hearts and lives for them to get through the day, let alone to get through what we might call the life of faith. So that by the time Beth and I returned to the United States in 1981, we were battle-hardened not only in a spiritual warfare of what it means to stand on the front lines for your faith, but we were battle-hardened from war, of all things, in our time. And then I finished seminary. I'm so glad that I knew Jesus before I went to seminary. I'm so glad that my heart and spirit had been formed in the hand of God enough to know what to do with all manner of doctrine. Because my experience of seminary did not teach me about God. My experience of seminary, however, did give me a gift. It taught me a lot about me. Some of it was wonderful, and some of it was awful. Have you ever looked in the mirror and realized that some of the things about you are detestable to God? Some of the things that you are strongest opinionated about are actually in God's way? And so because of that, the pride in me, and do you know what pride does to the Spirit? It, it kills. It kills. And so part of my formation in coming to North Carolina was to face the reality that I not only could I not fix the church, but as we cried out to God, as over and over we pleaded with the church to repent, we pleaded with the church to return, I believe, to its first love that it had lost and walked away from. We faced the recognition that in our experience, the church did not want that. And so why ask God, why would you bring me here if not to accomplish some wonderful thing like this? And the answer that came back to me was that I brought you here to break your heart. 
Anybody here have a broken heart? God does not despise a broken heart. So if your heart is here today and you're broken over the condition of the Moravian church, welcome. If you're here today and you actually, not only because of the Moravian church, but you're broken over the condition of people in this country, welcome. In fact, if you're here today and you look at the news and you're so sick of listening to what you hear every day in and out of of what is true, what is not true, how do you know the difference, and your heart is broken and grieved for the condition of this nation, welcome. Because, friends, this is not about the Moravian church. You just happen to be part of that part of God's work. And so... I hope, if anything, I can help set us free from thinking about things only Moravian and and rediscover something far richer and deeper that your spiritual ancestors knew. They knew they knew. So the text that God put on me when Dick ruined my happiness several weeks ago and said, I want you to talk to some concerned Moravian, because, by the way, those of you who know Dick know that he's relentless Huh? He's relentless. He is my brother, and we share in ministry to men all over the region. And it's a wonderful ministry. We meet several times a week, and we get to hear this incredible opportunity that one man shares the testimony of what God can do in a man's life. Could you imagine that being at all interesting or powerful? And it has changed my life because it has helped me to realize that God in you is just as powerful and God is just as important as God in me or anybody else that I've ever studied under. And in fact, when you tell the story of what you've seen and heard Jesus do, it will move mountains, it will change nations, and it may have to start by changing the heart of one crusty, old, pride-filled individual. And that even could be you or me today. So Jesus has his disciples with him in Matthew chapter 16, perhaps one of the more pivotal events of human history. And it says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 following, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others still Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Something happened there. Something happened as concerned followers of Jesus where it moved from being theoretical, it moved from being something popular to a personalized experience that not many people got. Because the first part of Jesus' question is the first caution that comes before me and I hope before us today would, who do people say that he is? And the answers were some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah, one of the prophets. But what is the problem with what people say about Jesus in every single instance? Everyone was wrong. In our culture, we would take an opinion poll. Who do you think he is? And the majority would win the day to put the name or the label on who he he actually is. But Jesus doesn't confront the wrongness of it. He he brings it even more down to the nitty gritty about the personal experience of it. You know, the earliest part of the Moravian movement in the 1300s was coming to grips with a deep concern in their own hearts as well. And the deep concern was as they looked to the church of Rome, they felt as though the church, what people were saying, had become corrupt. 
It had become other than the teachings of Jesus and other than founded on the belief of who he truly is. And so they actually began to go back to the scriptures and ask God to give them an experience of the earliest church without a thousand years of church decisions that had accumulated. And and part of what has come to me is as precious as the decisions of synods and councils have been over the years, none of them are the same as an encounter with the Son of God, the Messiah. As well-intentioned as the decisions of human beings might be, none of them are the same as the decision that is above all decisions, and that is the will of God Himself. I had a long struggle with this because I'm a man under authority. I'm a man who understands the respect of our spiritual heritage and ancestry. And actually part of my confession is an idolatry of that ancestry. For crying out loud, I've written books about it. And uh, I love what God did in the 13 and the 14 and the 15 and the 16 and the 17 and the 1800s. And I yearn that God might do it in our time as well in such a way. And so my heart grieves yet. But as I listen and look back, I realize that those believers were just like you and me because they were cut to the heart in their own time and their own condition. And they sought to find a way to respond to the sense that the church hierarchy, the church tradition had actually become just as or even more important than the teachings of Jesus himself. And so, in quiet ways at first, and then in more vocal ways, they began to articulate the simple gospel of Jesus in the language of the people of Bohemia, in the language of the German people, and it was forbidden by the tradition of human beings to be able to preach in the language of the people. And so businessmen actually built the Bethlehem Chapel so that continued preaching of the teaching of Jesus could go forth in the language of the people. That's risky stuff. And yet we look back on those days as though, if we're not careful, we imagine that that was a church building that John the Baptist, or excuse me, John Huss was preaching in. Mm -mm. It was a preaching station. A rather large one has a well right in the same room that the community would come and and draw water from. The followers of Huss, after his martyrdom, continued to struggle with, what do we now do? And some of them had great ideas. The Utraquists said, we just want to be able to take communion in both kinds. Maybe we could learn to get along with Rome. The Taborites, on the other hand, determined that they had to declare independence and they took up arms. And under Ziska, the one-eyed warrior, they went to war and they were incredibly successful for years. But some of the followers felt that accommodation with the tradition of Rome was unthinkable and taking up arms was unthinkable and in a very quiet and humble way they determined that there was no saving the Roman church. What to do? What do people say to do? Be careful. Jesus turns and says, well, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Only one person answered, and it was Peter. Actually, it wasn't Peter, it was Simon, the son of John, who becomes named Peter, and it's a sense of Jesus tongue-in-cheek, I think, joking with him, because if we've studied the life of Peter in the Gospels, we know that Peter made bold statements and then crashed and burned. And so it's as though Jesus is having a little fun with this up-and-down kind of polar opposite man who... uh, who wants to be faithful, wants to be fervent, and then runs and hides or denies even knowing Jesus. And so he says in response, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, because what you just said was not revealed to you by men, 
but revealed to you by your Father in heaven. The revelation of who Jesus truly is, not because someone else told us, but because God himself opened a hole in our hearts to perceive and, and to conceive the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, changes everything. Because if, in fact, this man, this God's love made flesh, is the Messiah and the Son of the living God, then the things he has to say must be pretty important. It was just a few years ago I was with a, a man from the Middle East who was a Muslim convert. He said, Kevin, I am not a Christian, but I follow Jesus. Because Christians have long been my enemy, and what Christians do in tradition is so hurtful and destructive, but Jesus is something altogether different. And he said, and looked at me, he said, Brother Kevin, he said, do you believe that Jesus meant the things he said. I would never really thought about it like that before. But if in fact Yeshua is the Messiah, the son of the living God, then he brings a direct communication as a, a, a revelation himself of the things on God's heart. And I have to now spend my time and energy in a fresh new way to seek him with all my heart and soul and mind and body so that I might know that if in fact he said it, then it needs to be the focus of my attention apart from other things that others would say. Even my own tradition. And so those earliest followers of Huss knew that accommodation with Rome was unthinkable, fighting further warfare was unthinkable, but they could no longer have part of what the tradition-driven church was doing. And so they withdrew to the hills of Moravia, to Kuhnwald, and there they determined to found a church that actually... Was a, was a new awakening simply focused on the person of Jesus and dedicated to the laws of Christ. I brought the hymnal out here because the hymn that was written for that occasion was written by one of the faith leaders of Kuhnwald in 1457. You know this, I'm sure. This is what brings us together. Join we all with one accord. Praise we all our common Lord, for we have all heard his voice. All have made his will our choice. Join we with the saints of old, no more strangers in the fold. One, the shepherd who us sought. One, the flock his blood has bought. One, our master, one alone. None but Christ as Lord we own. Brethren of his law are we. As I loved you, so love ye. This is the words of Jesus. Branches we in Christ the vine, living by his life divine. As the Father with the Son, so in Christ we all are one. One the name in which we pray, one our Savior day by day. One with, with one cup and with one bread, thus one covenant way we tread. One in spirit, one in life, one amidst earth's frequent stripes. One in faith, one in love, one in hope of heaven above. You've heard these before, haven't you? The oneness is not with the Moravian church. No offense to the Moravian church. This is before the Moravian church. This is as the, that which we call our beloved tradition is beginning. The oneness is not to a tradition. The oneness is to nothing less than the person of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and as we come to him together, it is he who makes us one. It is he who puts the name upon us that has any value or not. And part of the danger is we need to be very careful. We don't label ourselves as something more important than the oneness with who he is. I say that because after years of, of wrangling with a denomination in several provinces to return to its first love. I was actually in the Czech Republic praying with brothers about what to do. 
how could we go forward? It's not only the recent synod decisions that have been heartbreaking. I, I can cite synod decisions 50 years back that have broken my heart and others. This is not something new. My guess is our spiritual ancestors were brokenhearted in a similar fashion, but the question and the challenge is, to what do we rally? Do we rally to another tradition of our own making? And as I was in prayer in the Czech Republic with Czech brethren who had been awakened in their faith fresh and alive, only to find that some ten years after the fall of the Iron Curtain and revival had broken out in the Czech Republic, that incredible division also came crushing down on fresh and new believers in our own denomination. The division was between those who had been spiritually revived and those who had determined to hold fast to the tradition above all else. And they went to war. And as I prayed with brothers in the Czech Republic about similar heartache here and what to do, I was convicted personally by the Holy Spirit of God that I was guilty of sin. And my sin was taking myself too seriously and the sin of striving to fix a church that for all intents and purposes had decided it didn't want to be fixed. Father, forgive me. I did the best I knew to do, but apparently I didn't know what I was doing. That's why Jesus' words from the cross are so helpful to me. Father, forgive him. He didn't know what he was doing. He thought he knew everything and he knew nothing because there are spiritual ramifications to the things that we do next. And if we're not careful and we take ourselves too seriously, we're going to end up going out there and creating just another denomination. Do you hear what I'm saying? Out of the best intentions. And so I want to applaud you again as you began today in a spirit of repentance and a spirit of prayer. I know no other direction forward. Because when all is said and done, I don't believe God is going to ask me whether I was a good Moravian. I do think he's going to hold us accountable to whether we loved his son and whether when we heard his voice, we knew it and we followed it regardless of what got in the way. Jesus said, he who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. When the winds came and the rain came down and the floods came up, that house stood secure because it was built upon the rock. The rock is not Peter. The rock is the revelation of who Jesus really is. That's why he's our chief object by day and night. That's why it's in him and him alone that we live and move and have our being. And if not, then we're wasting our time. In the name of Jesus, do you know who he is? And will you do whatever it takes to make sure you follow him above all? God bless. Words to live by. Let us take time and get to know him. Appreciate the essence of him in our lives as we sing this last hymn. Have thine own way, Lord. May the Lord be with us today.
Our Heavenly Father, as we have gathered here today, we have to know that you were present with us. The essence of your love for us and the guidance that you provide us has been revealed. Now, as we go into the world today, and as we take an inventory of our lives in this coming week, let us be mindful of what we have experienced here today and let us find ourselves to be in full relationship with you. For it is that that is of the essential. It is that that we have to have. May we experience the true love and understanding that you provide. Let us bask in all that is given to us, given to us through the scriptures, given, us, given to us through everyday experiences as we witness others coming to Christ. Let us be mindful of those that are hungry to hear his word and let us be, let us be found to be ever present with Christ. May the Christ in us touch this world outside. For it is in your name that we have met today. Amen.
I didn't want to, to violate the essence of God in this space as we listened to that music and hopefully prayed over what we've experienced today. I wanted to take the last moment to remind you that you're all invited to Fellowship Hall afterwards for we have some um, light uh, food. Most of it's um, desserts, but nothing wrong with dessert before a meal. Thank you for coming. <laughs>